So without too much further ado, for this session, I want to introduce our moderator, uh, who is Michael Reich. I think many of you are familiar uh, with Michael. He has really, he's really one of the first to kind of write the book on systems thinking, um, on the separation of ends and means and approaching health policy, and also making the connection, I think, from the last session where we ended up very much on the political dimension of policy. Uh, and so Michael is Professor Emeritus at the Harvard School of Public Health. And I hope I've brought enough people back, or scared, I hope I haven't scared them away, but now over to you. Good. Uh, Professor Emeritus means uh, that I keep working, but they stop paying me. Um, might undermine your credibility for conveying, you know, messages. Only with economists. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so um, let me first thank the panel for uh, being here and thank you for being here. You are the hardcore survivors <laughs> of, of this day. Um, and I hope that what we have to say will be of interest to you. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce... Uh, and you'll excuse me on pronunciations, but Nirmala uh, Ravi Shankar, who is senior fellow at Thinkwell India. You all know Nirmala. Uh, Joel Arthur, Joel Arthur, uh, uh, who is associate researcher at Rosadi in Burkina Faso. Octavio Gomez Dantes, uh, researcher at the Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública in Mexico. Um, and uh, Kafilat Bello, who is researcher and head of the policy and system department at Serhud from Benin. So um, Susan asked me to put together a few comments uh, for uh, this session and, and some reflections on the day. So, um, so, so I always listen to Susan. And uh, I've done that. And, I, and I'd like to offer you uh, three, three comments and reflections. So first is that I really like the question for today. It was probably Joe who wrote the question, but is what keeps us from separating ends and means in health reform? What keeps us from separating ends and means in health reform, which means we're not doing it as well as we should. So, you know, from my perspective, it's always good to have a clear question. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is reasonably clear. And, uh, and it's a good question. And it's an idea that, as Joe mentioned, uh, connects with work that I've done for a long time. Some of you may know this approach to health reform, which is a book getting health reform right. It's sometimes called the flagship course from the World Bank. It's sometimes called control knobs. It has different names, but it's associated in part with myself and some colleagues at Harvard. One key aspect of that approach is to say, let's start with problems. Okay, start your health reform journey with identifying some problem in health system performance, something you want to improve and something that has clear ethical importance uh, and is politically feasible to address. And this, this is partly what Oct Octavio was referring to when he said Michael's mantra about technical, ethical, and political needing to think about all three legs of the stool. And, and so in our method, we move from the problem to diagnosis, the causes of the problem, and then to proposed interventions. And so this, this, this is really an approach for practitioners. It says, if you want to do health reform, start with problems, which I think is what this question says too. Start with your ends. What do you want to achieve? Um, okay, that's my first comment. I like the question. It's a good thing to think about. Second comment is, let's think a little bit more about who us is. 
who is the us in this question? Um, in order to understand why we are not separating ends from means, we have to have an idea of who we is. So um, first let's think about policy practitioners. So practitioners may, may not be ends-driven reformers because they are not consequentialists. Consequentialists, a philosophical term, they start with a different principle. Separating end from means is fundamentally a consequentialist philosophical assumption. And there are other philosophical assumptions that take different approaches that don't separate ends from means. For example, like in, in my country, um, libertarians start with rights. And they say they want to introduce government intervention. They want more personal liberty. They say, don't make me wear a helmet. Don't make me get a vaccine. Don't make me wear a mask. Let me end my own life. And so there are lots of these different varieties, but these are not consequentialists. They're not separating ends from means. They're saying, I have a right to do what I want without government intervention. And the same is true for egalitarian liberals, some people who say, not based on consequences, let's make sure everyone starts from the same good point. Let's redistribute so people start from a fair position and can make fair choices. Um, so I'm going to skip a second point. But let's, in thinking about us, when I saw that question, I thought, well, Maybe, maybe, maybe the question is talking about WHO as us. Okay? So now there's an interesting question. Why doesn't WHO separate ends from means? Because actually, WHO spends a lot of time telling people what to do. Okay? It's often input-based what to do. It says, this number of doctors per this population, this number of beds per this population, this number of nurses, that is not thinking about ends, that's thinking about inputs. And, and it's interesting that separating ends from means doesn't talk about inputs, but um, what would a transformation of WHO into an ends-driven reform organization look like, and how could that happen? for an organization that calls itself normative. Okay, that's my second comment. Let's be clear about who the us and the we is that's not adequately separating ends from means. Um, my third comment is about actually the subject of the panel, which is research and researchers. So in some ways, Ends-driven reform is something that researchers relate to well. It's a, translated into research terms. It's, it's something that, that I used to repeat again and again and again. And someone once repeated to me again and again and again. What is your dependent variable? Okay, what do you want to explain? That's, that is your end point. And so it's important to have a clear dependent variable. That makes sense when it says ends-driven reform. And then when you have a clearly defined measurable dependent variable, you can think about independent variables. What are the things that cause that or are associated with that dependent variable? And, and for example, if your problem, your dependent variable is high maternal mortality, then you can sink out seek out causal and contributory factors that lead you in the direction of thinking about means, things to do to improve that. Okay, so this is something that seems basic to empirical researchers. But even here, it's not clear to me that we want all ends-driven research. Okay, and this, is, this gets back to Wangari's point, which is maybe this is a false dichotomy. Maybe it's not just ends, 
we also have to think about means and sometimes inputs, even for research. So research on explaining successful policy entrepreneurs is looking at politics of reform processes. That's not really ends driven. Research on the underlying ethical principles of different reforms. That's not really ends driven. That's thinking about ethics. So, um, so I came to some sort of mixed feelings about whether the, whether the um, recommendation to separate ends from means may be a little bit too black and white. And, uh, and so I'll be looking forward to our panel members and to you, our survivors. <laughs> you get special rights as survivors. Um, so, and the coffee is here. So as survivors, you get a special prize, <laughs> coffee in the afternoon. Um, and, and just as a, uh, uh, a slight advertisement, I will be speaking more about politics on Wednesday morning in the plenary. Um, so uh, the list that I have, I don't know how long each person is supposed to talk. Seven to 10 minutes. So we have one, two, three, four. Four times seven is approximately 30 to 40 minutes of comments. Um, then we'll open it up to questions and then we will close for the day. Okay, so let's start with Nirmala. Thank you so much, Michael, for that introduction because I think it sets me up well to um, first of all acknowledge you, know, you encouraged us to ask who's we and in this question it's about research and I should start by saying I'm not really a researcher. I'm more of an applied analyst perhaps but I commission research and I consume lots of research and I try to bring that research to policy implementation, policy research. Um, and so I'm starting from this sort of in-between space. And you also questioned, or I guess Wangari started this um, trend of breaking down these dichotomies. And so the first comment or the first reflection I had, which is really about stems from the work um, I've been doing with a bunch of people who are in this room on strategic purchasing across five different countries. Um, this question of when are you thinking about systems and when are you thinking about schemes? And in as much as we always want to be thinking about systems, but we often find ourselves focusing on one scheme. So we spent time hearing about the Gratuité program. Uh, we've talked about uh, NHIF in Kenya. Uh, we didn't hear as much from Philippines and Indonesia, but you know, there our work has been about looking at the health insurance program there. So is that wrong to focus on one scheme? And I was spending some time thinking about this last night as I was preparing. And I felt like perhaps there's a process here where you start, when we start looking at what the problems are and diagnosing those problems, you start with a, or you need to start with a systems perspective. You need to look at that scheme as being part of something bigger. And that helps you identify what perhaps the challenges are that you're trying to address through one particular mechanism. But then perhaps in the next stage where you're designing a reform and you're implementing that reform, you often are implementing a reform on a particular scheme. You're looking at how gratuity can work better or, or how Linda Mama can be implemented better. But then in that next stage where you're looking at, okay, well, has that particular reform that we just designed and implemented had the desired effect, then you're kind of going back out and looking at the system again. And so I kind of landed on this perhaps hourglass shape 
of a process where you start with a much broader perspective to understand what the challenges are. And that's sort of how our work has progressed in different countries. You start with that broad landscape, you zero in on a particular instrument that you feel is most critical or most powerful at that moment, given the larger system, and you implement certain changes, and then you zoom back out to see, well, did that have the desired effect? So the, just on the systems versus scheme question, it's not quite so much that you shouldn't ever be talking about schemes, but the way you talk about schemes needs to be grounded in a perspective about the system. And the second sort of reflection I had was about how hard it is actually to take that system's perspective and specifically from the point of view of data. And we've been doing a lot of work to understand how funds flow down to the facility level with which Gemini talked about earlier today. And you often find you can only actually track those resources for one scheme and even um, the work that, you know, thinking back to the work that I did on national health accounts, many of you have also worked on resource tracking methods. There aren't that many methods that allow you to track resources across the entire sector. NHA is perhaps one of the few, but it doesn't get into that level of detail that Gemini was talking about. How do you track resources down to the facility level? And so I found myself feeling like some of these digital solutions that allow us to look at the flow of funds across different schemes, across different mechanisms to the facility level. And to some extent, this also links to what Grace was telling us earlier today about integrate how important the digital part of um, the Ayushman Bharat reform in India is and the need to think about digital PFM systems. So we've been talking a lot about PFM, but how do we bring in um, a conversation about digital PFM that would allow greater uh, visibility over resource flows? And then finally, to I don't know if there's a natural progression from these two points, but certainly on this question of ends versus means, we've talked a lot today about facility autonomy and funds moving down to um, local levels and to facilities. But ultimately, that is still the means, right? And so the end is to see better outcomes through the means of moving more money to the facilities. And here, I am sort of struck by a much older literature which looked at autonomization of hospitals and you know, more autonomy to higher level facilities. And my understanding from that literature is that the results were quite mixed. You got some better outcomes, but you also got higher inefficiency, greater rent seeking, et cetera. So I think it's upon all of us who are working on this question of um, facility autonomy at the primary healthcare level to really now start, I mean, I think we're all convinced that autonomy is a good thing, but we need to actually see what the impact is and test, and so in terms of a research agenda that's more focused on the ends, and we have a lot of good insights about the means, we need to be moving to a research agenda that's looking at the impact of these reforms and under what conditions we see good outcomes from the, the um, greater autonomy and the greater push of resources down to the local level. So those were sort of three quick, um, or maybe not so quick, uh, reflections. And thank you once again, Susan, for giving me this opportunity to join this panel despite not being a researcher. <laughs> Thank you, Nirmala, and thank you for uh, reminding us that when you do research, you need to focus on where there are data, um, but at the same time, you need to have an eye at the broader system and how it works. Uh, so we'll move next to uh, Joel Arthur.
Okay, thank you very much. And I agree with what Nirmala said. Most of the time we spend our time to look at specific teams. And I think that this is very common in the research world. But I think what is most important, and you flag it, is to be aware of the environment while we are implementing the team or the reform we are doing. If, for example, I take the example of strategic elf purchasing in Burkina Faso, we struggle a bit to see how it could be implemented, and we see that it will be easier to start from a specific team that is gratuity with the intent to draw lessons and to see how we can infuse it, if I can say that, in other health financing reforms such as national health insurance and many other reforms. So from researcher perspective, it's easier to start from a specific team and to see now how we can draw lessons or to implement it in wider system. And regarding that, I can say that uh, what is important also to see is to look at the effect of the team or the reform in the environment and the context, but also how the context the system affect the team of a reform we want, we want to implement. I think this is very important because, for example, we design the team we want to implement in some way, but we face many difficulties. And if I take again the example of Burkina Faso, we have a lot of political issues, and you need to take this into account well, uh, to be able that what you design is implemented. So in research, we talked about theory of change. I think this is also important to, to take into account. And now, how can we put an end driving approach to research practically? I think that it is very difficult from my experience to start from a system-wide approach, I can say, to start from the objective we want to do. Because when you discuss with policy makers, sometimes the idea are changing a lot. I remark that in my own experience. And Sometimes you should be aware that policy makers sometimes want to legitimize some choice they have ever made or they assume that something works and they need the researcher to come and to kind of uh, legitimate or validate some choices that has already been made. I think this is very important to be aware of and to avoid such, such flow. And the challenge I see when we want to implement system-wide approach, I think in this use is the, the time frame. I think this is important. Because if, for example, you want to look at the result, we know that the team of reform we implement, we don't have quick result, and the objective has not come, not come very quickly. So we need a large time frame. And we know that this conflict sometimes with the needs of policy makers. So sometimes if you want to work with policy makers, that is very important when you want to do end driving research. Sometimes there are tensions between researchers and also policy makers. And another challenge I think I see is funding. 
because I think it's important to promote uh, research program instead of, of isolated research project. Because when you look at isolated research project, you used to look at small uh, teams or specific teams, but if we need to make research that is that look at the system, we need what I can say program research that embraces a lot of topics because we need most of the time many disciplines. So we need to implement inter multidisciplinary research and it's important to have program research. And when we talked about program research, it also means a lot of money. And we know that in the health policy and system research, we don't have lots of money like clinical trials research. So I think it's important to <laughs> make advocacy well, to have a lot of more money to implement health policy and system research. And I think I will end with that. And I hope that my English is not very, very, but I hope it's very. <laughs> Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. C'était formidable. So, um, Joel, Joel Arthur reminds us that researchers are trained to look at specific problems, but researchers in public health want their research to make a difference in policymakers. Okay, so, and, and that is a fundamental dilemma. That's a structural dilemma because the research that we write to get published in journals like the one that I run um, <laughs> is not, is, you have to be focused, you have to be clear, you have to be, have clear variables, it has to be well written, but it's not what policymakers read and it's not what they want. So uh, recently, someone has said to me, Michael, how do we talk to politicians? I said, that's a really good question. And, and there's nothing that I know that tells researchers how to talk to politicians. It's something that I believe really strongly, and I think Joel is talking about the dilemmas of talking to politicians. What do politicians want? They don't want problems, they want solutions, okay? So part of the reason you can't separate means from ends is that one of your clear audiences, the politicians, the leaders, they don't want to hear about problems and the causes of problems. They want to know, what can I do quickly that will make a difference, that will solve the problem, that will get me reelected? Pause. Pause it. I just wanted to add one point to your your comment about the the politicians is also and the and the, the where the what they want in terms of the data our role in bridging the gap between research and policy making it's also the fact that we rely on often public data on data that comes from public systems in which then if our research comes out in conflict to what they're looking for, it also becomes difficult. And so just to add that as an so additional. So that's addition. a really good point to lead to my friend Octavio. Octavio uh, was my student um, before some of you were born <laughs> um, and is a good friend. You know, what, what has the current administration done in Mexico that uh, he said has eliminated Seguro Popular? they're not collecting data about what they do. So it can't be evaluated. Octavio. Well, thank you, Michael. And uh, I have no excuse. I'm, I'm a researcher. I, I spent six years working as the head of the Office for Performance Evaluation at the Ministry of Health, but that was it. The rest of my professional career I had spent it in uh, a research institution, the National Institute of Public Health, more specifically in a center that's called 
Center for Health Systems Research, so I have no excuse. I, I need to know about the questions of these sessions. Uh, I would like to make three comments. First, <coughs> we're asking ourselves about the need on uh, research on ends-driven health system research. And uh, when trying to, to answer to this question, I remember a paper I read by the former editor of the BMJ, Richard Smith, who said that uh, many people assume that clinicians uh, in, in the UK, they get the BMJ every Friday, they read it over the weekend, and then they put into practice why the, the, the results of research that were published in that particular issue. And he says, this is, this is not reality, this does not happen. It takes a while for research results to be implemented by clinicians. And I think this is the case for ends-driven health system research. This, this buzzword, and I'm a health systems researcher, it's a new buzzword. Um, I, I would argue that most of my, of my colleagues at the Center for Health Systems Research are not familiar with this type of uh, concept. I'm, I'm happy that it's coming up, but I think that one of the things that you need to do in order to promote this type of research is to disseminate it uh, as fast as you can, to discuss it, to explain it, and uh, to uh, make people aware about the importance of this type of research. So I think this is, this is very important, and I know it firsthand because I come from a center that specialized in, in this kind of, I, I would say that we got stuck in research oriented towards universal health coverage. That's where, where we were at. I would argue that uh, one of the reasons that we are still not doing this type of research is that the consensus around the final objectives of all health systems is a recent consensus. The idea of uh, intrinsic objectives of health systems has no more than 20 years. The idea was developed probably at the same times by two type, by two group of researchers. On the one hand, Christopher Murray and Julio Frank, and on the other, four researchers from the Harvard School of Public Health. Mike Roberts, Bill Shaw, Peter Berman, and and Michael Reich. So until then, most of the research in, uh, in health system was devoted to implementation of primary healthcare activities. It was very much focused on one of the functions of health system, which was basically the delivery of essential services. We assume that by doing that right, everything will fall into place and the health conditions of the populations would improve. So I think this is why one of the reasons why we're getting late into this type of research. There's a recent, very recent consensus about the main objectives of a health system. And I would uh, like to end by referring to, to, I think it's the final questions that were delivered to us for this session, which is what could we do to improve the dissemination of this idea and to develop this type of research? I would say that one of the th first things you need to do, this is part of the policy cycle, you need to put the topic into the agenda. Uh, and this means placing this, this concept into the agenda of research communities, uh, very importantly into the agenda of funding institutions, global foundations. This is one thing that we need to do. And locally, I think that this is something that can be useful and it was done uh, 25 years ago by a very important commission, Commission on Health Research for Development, that suggested to have periodically exercises uh, for the definition of pr health priorities, in our case, health system priorities. So I believe that if locally we can develop this type of exercise, we can introduce these concepts and we can identify the type of research that we can do in order to uh, 
attend the need for ends driven health system research. I think I will leave it there and uh, probably discuss some other ideas in uh, the question and answer session. Thank you. Good. Uh, thank you, Octavio. So, um, urging, urging the organizers to disseminate the buzzword. I, I would urge them to um, explain it well before they disseminate it. Um, and I would urge them to uh, look at some of the ethical principles and some of the political issues associated with it. And I would urge them also to be sure that what they do is consistent with the new buzzword. That, uh, you know, if you're going to disseminate a principle, you should be consistent with the principle. Um, that's a sort of like, circular principle, but okay. Uh, we'll go now to uh, Kafilath, and then we'll open it up to comments. Thank you, Michael, and thank to all of the colleagues that are here. So I'm Kefilat from Benin, and uh, uh, I my, the challenges that I will share are very similar to ev what we all face, but particularly to what Joel shared. And in my country, in Benin, I think uh, one of the key challenges to have end-driven uh, research is uh, mainly actually where the question are coming from and where the funding are coming from. Because traditionally we have very, very little domestic resource. So what we usually end up doing is having researches, you know, based on the grants that come out and use at that, uh, that point it's very difficult sometimes to really, you know, go uh, beyond um, maybe just having research on a specific topic, on a specific uh, scheme, on a, a specific intervention. And I think we uh, at CIRIT, which is the research center I I'm working uh, in, uh, we had long, many years, you know, functioning like that, but at a point it was just impossible to continue, even if it's difficult, because uh, what we used to say is that we have research, we want to go to uh, policymakers, share the result with them, but then when you come to them, it's just like, well, th this is very interesting, but what do I have to do with it? Because this is not actually my priority. And it was easy at a point to say, well, these policymakers, they don't know what they're talking about, they don't implement research um, output, but we also realized that Indeed, even if these are very important questions, maybe these are not the questions that are really needed to be answered on, at the time that we went to the policymakers. So, and I think we are very lucky to have, you know, uh, we could in our countries have um, f through the years more and more capacities and also uh, trying to have more and more system thinking approaches so that we start, we, uh, thinking on well, I think we still have this funding structure that is not easy, but we can do something else. And what we we are now trying to do is trying to combine three approaches. So, we st and I like the, uh, Michael comments that it's not black and white. It's not uh, let's separate uh, ends from uh, means. We maybe sometimes we need to combine both. So, uh, one thing that we also realize is that. Even if we still have this funding structure and the, uh, also the, we, we are lucky now more and more in the global health uh, arena, if we, voices are raised and trying also to, to also, let's say, sensitize also people that give funding to say, well, we need to, to have a funding that really deals with uh, problems. But I think we are now more and more able to bring our own voices in setting the research agenda. And for, for that, we really try to have this approach of really trying to frame the, 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 the problems. And a good example in my country is, for instance, when we started, uh, when the COVID pandemic started, I think we were really with the government and also with other research institution in our country and in our region, able really, even before we have all these big waves in uh, our context, trying to identify what could be the, the, the key evidence needs. And I think it was really, 
interesting in our country when we have, for instance, funding from Enabel or funding from other uh, donors to be able to say, well, these are the problems we identify with the policymakers. And it was quite also interesting to see that even if we have to address more global question, it was very important and very also possible for us to bring uh, out what was the real need of our policymakers and also our population at that time. And another approach that we are trying now to promote and with also our colleagues from uh, Burkina and uh, other uh, countries is that we, we, we like to call it the sedimentation approach. This, because Joel said that within the time frame of a project, it's very difficult to really take the time to understand the need, take the time also to bring uh, look, um, context adapted uh, solution to the problem that we have. but trying at least to, when we have um, research institution or local institution that are there, because even after the project, these institutions are still there, where this institution could be able actually in a long-term basis to have a long-term research agenda and also to have more time, more space to discuss with policymakers. And we really like to say, uh, to talk, um, this, about this approach at the sedimentation approach, trying really to build every time on the, uh, the projects that are coming, also trying to bridge, because something we also realize is that we have these solution uh, streams and we also have the problem streams, and usually what happens is that it's difficult to match the two, but for us as research institution, being there, being in the context, and also being connected to other uh, parts of the world, we are able really to have more this uh, matching. So I think this is something that we have started to try to apply. So yet it's still not difficult, uh, easy, is uh, because when we talk of system, when we talk also of co connection, uh, it's much easier to have very, very specific question than to have question that uh, will um, deal with complexity, but I think this is something we believe in and we really started to go for it, so thank you. Good, Kafila. so you give us the answer. Um, the answer is uh, researchers, everyone here, uh, needs to develop the skills for talking with policymakers in ways so that you can help, you with them can help to match the problems with the solutions. Of course, the third stream is politics, right? So it depends on, because sometimes, sometimes we, and here by we I mean not, not, no. This case, I mean we, not just countries in Africa, countries in Latin America, countries in North America. We sometimes elect politicians to be our leaders who are not interested in listening to researchers. Think about the previous president in my country. <clears throat> not don't think about him too long. Uh, think about the president of Mexico. Think about the previous president in Brazil. Um, the cab driver I was with today raised questions about what's going to happen in Colombia with the new president Petro. Okay, sometimes policymakers are not interested in empirical issues and facts, and I think in those situations, it creates real problems for researchers uh, who want to talk truth to power. Okay, it's not easy. Um, okay, so we have finished. It is now 3.32 or 3. Uh, we have time for comments and questions. I would say it's been a long day if there are not really important comments <laughs> and questions. There's more coffee, and uh, we can all go out, and uh, I don't know if it's raining now, but we can at least enjoy some fresh air. Michael, you're making your objectives explicit, which is good. <laughs> I want them to be uh, uh, content effective. So comments or questions for the panel or, or anything else? 
about the day? One, two, three, four, five. Okay? Yes, thank you. Um, I really would like to ask why I can, what can I do to talk with the politicians, but I understood that is a very big mystery of the mankind. So, um, and develop capacities, I agree with this, but perhaps we can do another thing about this. Um, perhaps we, we can sensibilize to the social, um, the um, social society, civil society, sorry, uh, to make, um, to promote the health system research and talk to, uh, talk about, talk to the population too. Um, we haven't um, forget that uh, politicians are elected by people. So uh, I think people should be conscious that um, health system research exists. They see if they ignore this, it, uh, <laughs> they, they go and say anything about. Um, I am a, s a researcher in health system, uh, health system. I studied this in Belgium since uh, 18 uh, years ago. In a conversation with a colleague, a Mexican colleague, Gustavo Nihenda, that perhaps the doctor uh, knows, we reflected about what the politicians could uh, have uh, about this uh, uh, health system research. Yes, perhaps don't interest, or perhaps, uh, I refuse to believe this, but perhaps, perhaps I have the best uh, costume you wear for um, Halloween, no? I, I tell them I am a researcher of health system research, boo! And they're going to be scared. Thank you for reminding us that it is Halloween. Um, I, you know, I think it, 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 it remains a, a question of how to talk to politicians. Talk to them in simple terms, like you're talking to a child. Clearly repeat it and, and look for things that they want to hear. Sir, can you identify yourself and your institution? Okay, my name is Gemini Nimtei. I'm working with Apt Associates in Tanzania. I think listening to all the four of you, we're getting more research questions. It's like the f kind of four problems, which I don't know, they need to be researched to find a solution. The first one, we were saying here, there is a problem in terms of alignment between what the policy want with the research that we are doing. The second issue that is coming, we are blaming the politicians. Don't say we're blaming them. They're not taking the research into practice. And then we have the aspect of funding for research. And then we have who drive the research, the issue of the partners driving the research. So if we look at these four areas, it's like a deadlock, like where are we going to unlock this so that we can have the useful research? And from the discussion that we have, I feel like we are missing, we are missing the common ends that we need to do the research so that we can unlock all these four areas. And we, have the, we had the discussions today also about the multi-sectoral collaboration. So I think part of the big agenda for the research is how can we come up with this common end that will get a buy-in across these different levels, the politicians, the researchers themselves, but also the funding organization. So we really have a task of, uh, I don't know, should we say like uh, a process mapping across this all this process of research, and then we can come up with a, a definition of the common ends so that we can fit these different pieces of the puzzle together. I think to me that is really a, a, a main challenge that we need to, to look at this space. Good, thank you, Gamini, for identifying seeking common ends. Maybe when we find common ends, which occurs only at certain moments, then you can actually make change. The next person, sir. Thank you so much. I'm Walimbo Ali, I Minister of Health Uganda. Just to say that uh, I hear discussion uh, calling politicians, policymakers, but I uh, also know that technical people like a permanent secretary is a policymaker that actually makes a policy and takes to the minister, and most likely 80 percent of what is there will be taken by the, the politician. So we need to look at who a policymaker is and target accordingly. Two, I just wanted to share my experience. Maybe can also provide some of the solutions. Researchers sometimes 
feel confident and they can, I think she mentioned it, they can develop a question, a, a problem, address it in the research and bring it to you, that this is what happens. But most cases, sometimes we've had them presenting what is the opposite of what is on the ground. That if you probe, then they say, okay, this was like this. So we, we told them, if you want us to own the research, when you are designing it, kindly come to us and we can say, these are the areas, just address them like this. I think in my country, researchers have done that, and I think we are progressing well. We sit together, identify, we leave it to, to them to analyze, and they are able to, to do that. But in the past, I think we would look at it and say we have nothing to do with it. It actually contradicts what is on the ground, go and check. So I think if we did that, that would be the best too. We also need to make sure that uh, we look at the politics. But uh, what my, my understanding is that we do not find, in my country, we do not find much resistance from the political leaders. If you have worked with the technical people, who then, if a minister of health, you then get a technical team, address, get the research to the minister of health. The minister of health then goes to cabinet, explain this to well, with you around him or her, then you can make notes, that flows very well. So in the, in, in, by the time it, reach the, it reaches the president, perhaps they can reject 20%, but 80% will be taken. Short of that, when you have a, a, something that is very detached to the reality, then you may expect these challenges. Thank you, Sana. Good, thank you, Ali. Um, Joe, are you keeping, who's next? Sheila. Th thanks, Michael. So uh, three, three comments. I think uh, my first comment is if you replace the term ends-driven research with ends-driven evidence generation, it becomes all the more inclusive and policymakers and practitioners become part of that larger circle of uh, looking for the, the problem and the means to the solution. The second comment is that policymakers themselves are, they are comprised of a set of stakeholders. It's not, they are not just politicians. They can be civil servants, bureaucrats, street level. I mean, different layers of stakeholders are in that community. And it's good to understand who are those stakeholders because each might have a different problem that they're looking to solve. My third comment is that um, uh, facilitating policymakers in asking the question is critical and it's a responsibility of the researcher to help them do that. A lot of them are, uh, carry the burden of a problem or a question that they're trying to solve. Um, but nobody's uh, often helped them with the means to solve that. So I think that's the onus there lies on us. Good, thank you for, again, um, a, a, a suggestion of better communication and better problem solving with policymakers. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Caleb Mulongo, a health financing specialist from Kenya. Just a quick question. Um, there's quite a lot of reflection around right, the right questions um, in research, but now also reflecting on the mind of a politician who has a term that may last four, five, eight years, 10 years, how then do you as a researcher design your research in a way that then is able to, de to deliver short-term, quick, de demonstrable uh, gains, because that is what they want, um, uh, so that they're able to embrace research as it were? Good, next. Um, hi, this is Stephanie Hyung. I'm um, from Chai, Malawi. I'm leading the health financing and health workforce programs. I just really wanted to concur with, with what was said by um, MOH Uganda in terms of ensuring that research is commissioned you know, by the ministry. Um, one good example in Malawi is um, at one of the local universities, there's a health economics and policy unit where they convene a think tank of Ministry of Health directors on a periodic basis. And those directors are the ones that push out research questions that this unit in the local university then helps answer. Um, the unit is also funded by FCDO, so they have you know, flexible funding, and in turn, they're able to 
respond directly to questions that are given to them by government. And so I think, you know, it's still a new model and it's still a fledging unit, but I think also encouraging international funders to also think about, you know, empowering local universities to flexibly respond to government as opposed to, you know, always channeling funds through separate projects, which may or may not respond to the actual needs of, you know, the ministry leadership. Great. I think we're almost through. If anyone already wants to. So, so Just a small one in relation to this uh, politics, because it Not, seems like nothing related to politics is small. Yeah, <laughs> it's a small question related to that big issue. So, like, how are we going to to address that? Because we we heard the example in Rwanda today. I think also on the side of research, we might want to document that. Like, how do we unlock or reduce that gap between the research and the politicians? And I think it might start from the technical aspect within the, the ministries. Like why is, for example, Rwanda has managed to get a buy-in up to the political, to the high level of politics while the others are struggling. So what is the role, what is the entry point? If the research can get through the technical uh, aspect within the ministries, maybe there's a better way of diffusing that through the technical aspect to the political arms. But again, that's raising, is raising another challenging question. Does it mean most of our policy objectives and goals, are they really short term? Because we are worried if this politician is going, or if this politician is doing this, then the whole system is, is collapsing. So we have a challenge also of creating resilient policy objective so that they can be sustained over time, even if the politicians are moving away. So that's another challenging area. How can we really create those kind of resilient systems? Yeah. Great, thanks. Good, thank you very much. We're yes. Yes, uh, I am going to pretend to be the one defending the politicians. I must uh, give a disclaimer, I have never held elective post, so I am doing it without authority and without <laughs> mandate, but I will defend them. Um, by giving two examples. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, I, I kind of tried to paint a picture. By the time Kenya closed uh, our borders, it was uh, mid-March 2020. It was at the height of the pandemic in uh, Italy and Spain and spreading west. Um, and one of the met metrics that were being tracked is how many people have COVID. And you know, you know how COVID is tested, you stick a thing in your nose and then you test it. And at that time it was the automated testing or the manual test, very complicated. And you have to have uh, an army of people who can stick things in people's noses and then those things for sticking and then the machines and then and then and then. I'm trying to depict that there were of course not enough inputs, but the way of measuring how bad you are doing is by testing people. So I, in the president's office, needed to know how many people have COVID. And I went to the researchers and I asked, how do I know how many people have COVID? But everyone has told us how to measure COVID is incidence. But I am saying to them that the only way we can know is prevalence because I don't have enough inputs. But uh, my good friends at WHO have not blessed prevalence as a measure. So it is not available to me. And we fought for three months, not just with the researchers, but with uh, many of uh, the people I was looking to for resources. And thank God I was able to convince a few who finally came around and we did measure prevalence of COVID. And this information was then used to guide how we um, rolled out our locking down and opening up response. This information was actually not put out to the public, but the uh, National Emergency Response Committee that was making decisions um, used the information on COVID antibody prevalence, not incidents, not how many things we stuck, not how many lab tests we did, but th this was not acceptable. One of the things that the researchers told me is that this we, we can't do this research because of all the things that Prof. Rick said, we don't have the right dependent variable, we don't have the right, we don't have the right. And then he said to me, and if we don't have those things, then I cannot publish in a magazine called Nature. <laughs> and there was another one called Science. 
And then I said, what's that? I don't care if you publish there. I need this information to know if I can open or not. I am answering the question that sometimes, uh, uh, oftentimes, as uh, my colleague Elias here just said, the researchers are, uh, have a structural dilemma. Example number one. Example number two was on UHC. I want to implement, uh, implement UHC using NHIF in Kenya. And so I tell the researchers, go figure out how I can do this. And they go and they do a lot of work on benefit packages and on NHIF reforms. And then they bring the evidence. And then the minister makes a decision that we shall not use NHIF. And then all the researchers tell us that we do not use evidence-based decision making, but the decision can be not to, is, is that an option? Is the option to synthesize the information and then not, uh, not implement the reform in the manner that was originally thought of? Uh, as I said, um, defending without mandate the politicians. So let me uh, join uh, Wangari maybe not exactly defending politicians, but urging you to get to know politicians. So having conversations, understanding their perspectives, and, and becoming, in a sense, friends with politicians. And that, that will develop your ability to explain your research, research perspectives, in ways that they can do that. So, so I have done, this is speaking from personal experience, I have done that with someone in the US Congress who's a friend of mine, I've done that with a politician in Japan who's one of the leading people in global health, I've done that in Argentina, I've done that in Uganda. So it's, this is something you can do in your own context. And there are ways of not always doing research, but helping politicians understand a research perspective in ways so that they can make decisions in uncertainty with the best understanding of the situation as possible at that moment because they are constrained by time. Um, so so, so uh, Octavio would like to make a comment. I would like to suggest that since we have a few minutes left, if Joe or Susan want to make any final comments on the day and where we have ended up in thinking about ends and means, you know, did, did we end up at, with the end that they wanted for today? Was this the right means to get us to that end? Octavio? Uh, I just, just want to make a comment. I think <clears throat> having worked with the Ministry of Health and with politicians, I would argue that Michael is probably <clears throat> overestimating the willingness of politicians to listen to researchers. I think that the resistance to work with researchers is, is enormous. Uh, and however, there, there are things that could be done and I would say that a good starting point is, is this one. Uh, WHO, I think it's a good place to, uh, to promote this type of research. Uh, I know that in uh, the Pan American Health Organization, the regional office of WHO for the Americas, ministers of health get together at least once a year. And uh, these events have been incredibly useful for policy dis dissemination since the very creation of this institution. So promoting the idea of uh, health systems research within this type of events would be incredibly important. O Octavio, we can have a longer discussion about whether I'm overestimating or underestimating. Um, Nirmala had a comment. So just that, you know, I have to agree with Octavio. Before I sort of wandered into health financing, I was a student of politics, and we would study, you know, election outcomes and so on. And I never heard anyone say, oh, it's driven by evidence, that, you know, 
people pick manifestos driven by evidence or the median voter cares about evidence. It was only when I sort of wandered into this field that I learned about this term, evidence for decision making. And then health people would sit around and talk about, oh, politics sort of getting in the way of important decisions. And so I, I, do, I, I do wonder if we're still, we still have it sort of upside down. I feel like politics is what actually happens. And when it's appropriate for a politician to pick a certain piece of evidence to push something that would get him re-elected or her re-elected, those are those opportunities that open up for influence. So this is probably a little bit late in the day to start arguing about whether politics and politicians are good or bad, um, <laughs> or whether they're rational or listen to reason. But, but they are human beings, okay? And they do communicate, and, uh, and it's in some sense incumbent on us to be able to communicate with them effectively. And, um, and, and Wednesday morning in the plenary, I will be talking about this in some more detail with uh, my own thoughts about why it's important to relate to politics and politicians in ways that they can understand us and what we're doing. Um, okay, Joe, Susan, did you have, Susan? Uh, I'll go first and then it'll be and over to Joe for the last words. But first, thank you to the panel. Thank you to Michael, Octavio, Joel, Kefi, Nirmala, to everybody for staying this long. Um, I think I was reflecting at this end and trying to think about the beginning and the end. And so the beginning of the day, I was really impressed by the passion with which all of the policymakers, implementers spoke about the ends that they were working to achieve. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons we, we sit here and, and their comment about the fact that what makes this conference special in this group um, of researchers is that we are always at the interface between research and policy making and, and going back and forth and I think the day really perfectly captured that interface very nicely. Um, and also just to give some hopefulness in terms of this question about the politics and the research agenda. And for those of us who, who studied the large health systems reform, and I'm thinking of Turkey, Mexico, Thailand, we were taught, Michael, um, that, uh, that a lot of work went into the research and design of those policy reforms well before the political window of opportunity opened. And so to give hope for those people who have the passion about the ends and are really searching for those means and want to have those means um, evidence-based and researched and ready and, and along the lines of the long road to reform, maybe it's the long road to, to ends-driven research and, and what that means in practice. And so uh, just to really thank everybody for, for giving that kind of the concrete examples and the practicalities, but also really tying together the, the themes of the day. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Susan. Yeah. And my thanks to everyone as well. I'm going to, I, I decided not to use my uh, 25 slides because Michael really was talking about getting out of here soon. Uh, so I have a lot of scribbling to do. Um, or, or a lot of scribbling to read from, but I, I was struck, Wangari made the point at the end of earlier comments uh, that, you know, people matter, people matter more than systems in a way. You wanna have a good system, but it doesn't do well without people, and I think that's also reflected uh, in our session today. We had some really great people um, to share experience openly and you know, I think it, it was really a privilege to to be here and to uh, to hear all of that. I was just I'm thinking, you know, while I, I'm not going to comment too much on the whole day, obviously the most um, things that are coming to mind, I guess, are from this last session. And uh, Michael did find out that the hidden agenda was really about fixing WHO, 
Uh, and I've been doing that, f trying to do that, I guess, for o over 25 years. Um, you can see how well it's worked. But one part of it, and I think also what drove the a lot of the approach here today in this session was that I'd worked in different parts of the organization, different places in the organization, and I was first in headquarters and then moved around. And one of the things that frustrated me when I wasn't in headquarters, and I think I said this this morning, was the emphasis on tools and standard indicators um, that seem to be portrayed as a substitute for thinking that we will do that for you so you don't have to worry. And that is really a fundamental problem. It, it speaks a little bit to, I think, what Joel and Kefi were saying and others, I think Gemini said as well, which is how, especially in countries where external funding is really critical, that it's driven by, in, it can be often driven by what might be seen as the so-called global health agenda, which is short term. I mean, the, the, the fund, those agencies, their leaders, it's not only WHO, but also donors as well, they're also on a political cycle. And so they, you know, the, the focus is very short term and at worst can be about extracting data so that we can report and justify how well we're doing. Right, so this is, this is really a problem. I had a, a, a real privilege in one case when I was based uh, for a short period in one country in Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia and it was explicitly to lead work on what was new there at the time which was applied health policy research because they'd never done that. And I didn't realize how fortunate I was because in this case the funding agency which was what, what the agency that was formerly known as DFID, um, said, we're not gonna actually define what, you know, I, I work with them and, and the funding agreement was, consisted of indicative areas of work because the whole idea was to talk to the minister, the leadership, the politicians, or, you know, to, and to kind of essentially do what some of you were saying, which was to try to elicit the policy priorities and then transform them into a research agenda, right? And so this is, I didn't realize how unusual it was. I wasn't trained in it like normal. I'm not like a, policy, a researcher per se, but it just made a lot of sense. Uh, and it was only after getting back to Geneva that I saw how unusual that was because it's kind of like with a lot of the funding agencies, it's about their indicators uh, and you producing them. I think what Kefi said is really important. The, the skill and the art that you need to provide is to make use of that in a way that actually suits your needs, right? And, and that, that takes a lot of creativity, I think. A couple of other things. One was really, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about, well, somebody mentioned the issue about interesting policy questions. And, and I was thinking about interesting and uninteresting ones. And, and it speaks a little bit to what we talked about in terms of thinking about the unit of analysis and, and this whole point of, Think, you know, distinguishing ends and means, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But there were, there have been papers published about that have showed that, for example, uh, voluntary community-based health insurance makes its members better off. Okay, a lot of research goes into that. And then if you step back and think about it, this research is aimed at, or has shown that people who made the choice to buy a product turned out to be better off for having bought that product. Right? And those that didn't, probably didn't. Does that help me in any way? That's what I see as the wrong unit of analysis, right? Because, um, you know, if, of course, if they didn't, weren't better off, they wouldn't buy it, they would drop it, okay? So it's not a particularly helpful way of thinking. And so this idea, what we've tried to promote here and, and in other work is to say, how do you, how do you, yes, you analyze the scheme, which is a means, but assessing the effects at the wider level right, in order to make that, that judgment. Our focus, I think, on this question of, you know, separating ends and means in health reforms and applied policy research is important. It doesn't mean ends-driven 
thinking or policy or research doesn't mean that the means are neglected. The research is all about the means in a way. Um, you know, it's the, it's the Alice in Wonderland problem that if you don't know, if you don't know where you're going, then anyway, anyway, it will get you there, right? So whatever it is, there has to be some agreement, some discussion about this is what we're trying to achieve. Then I have some basis for actually looking into the means, but the reforms that are being analyzed are all about means in that sense. So I think it's, it's not a, uh, or it may be a false dichotomy. It's not one or the other, of course. It's really about assessing the hypothesis and whether, again, that's the, the policy reform or the research question that we're gonna do these things because we, you know, our hypothesis is that it will have these effects on the goals that we care about, right? So this is, I think, what we're, we're trying to get at. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that. Some people know that, that uh, um, I have written emails that are too long to be published in a journal, so I should probably stop here. Uh, and just thank everybody for coming, for, for staying with us. Uh, really wish you uh, a good week and appreciate how many people are, are still with us. And so thanks for your great contributions throughout the day, uh, including those of you who are not in the room now but were earlier. And really hope you have a good time this week. And Susan is going to tell me what, what to say at the end. No, just, just, <laughs> just to acknowledge the fact that we've been working on this oh, yeah. as a team across all of these organizations since last February. And so, and it's been a real pleasure and I think of collaborative effort. So just to really recognize that as yes. well. And so thanks to our partners who are here and not here. Great, and have a good week.